The title of my book is How to Talk to a Science Denier, and that's also the uh, title of the, uh, the talk that I'm going to be uh, talking about today. And what I want to do is talk to you about how to defend science from science deniers by giving scientists and science communicators some better tools to push back. Now, you might say, what better tools could you possibly have to push back against a science denier than scientific evidence? But here's the problem. You don't convince somebody who doesn't hold their beliefs based on good evidence by giving them more evidence. Uh, that's called the information deficit model, where you, you treat science deniers like they were just uninformed scientific colleagues, but it does not work. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So we need a bit more strategic approach for handling science deniers. I want to start with what the academic research tells us. Um, some people are quite worried about something called the backfire effect, which was due to um, Brenda Nine and Jason Riefler. They wrote a paper in uh, 2010. And the backfire effect, um, in the, the actual paper, what they found was that if you had people who were dug in on a mistaken belief and you presented them with correcting information, uh, they did not change their mind. Now, the backfire effect was... Um, a little bit further than that. Uh, a in a few cases, they found that there were people who not only didn't change their mind, but somehow being exposed to the um, disconfirming information managed to confirm the belief. Okay, so that's a very perverse effect, how being provided uh, correcting information made them double down and hold that belief uh, more strongly. Well, the good news is that that finding uh, could not, that uh, secondary finding, the backfire effect finding, could not be replicated. A Porter and Wood and some other folks did some work uh, a few years later and found that that was a unicorn. It maybe you know existed once, but it was not statistically significant. It, it, it never showed up again. And Nine and Riefler joined them uh, in this uh, as good scientists and, and realized that you know that, that it didn't exist. That is very good news for speaking to science deniers because it means that you can't make things worse. So if you were holding back and speaking to um, anti-evolutionists or climate deniers for the thought that, well, if I speak to them, I'm just going to make them double down on their belief. It's not true. The backfire effect uh, finding was, uh, uh, was not able to be reproduced, so you can, uh, you can go ahead. As one commentator in this debate put it, we're fact resistant, but we're not fact immune. And one of the studies that, uh, one of the, uh, the later studies that found that there was no backfire effect was a brilliant study by Cornelia Betch and Philip Schmid that appeared in uh, Nature Human Behavior in the summer of 2019, in which they uh, provided the first empirical evidence to show that you could change a science denier's mind. And I joked with my friends that I could have read that study if my hair were on fire. I, were, I, I was waiting for a study like that to come along. And here it was. Um, they conducted the study online with audiences from the United States and Germany. And what they did was they presented them with uh, incorrect information. And then they immediately provided the correcting information, just somewhat like um, uh, uh, Nyan and Riefler had done. And what they found is that in a statistically significant number of cases, you could get people to change their minds. Now, the interesting part of, of this is that there were two methods that they checked. Uh, the first was called content rebuttal. And that's just what you would think it would be. It's when you provide you know, the facts to change somebody's mind. Now, you have to be an expert in the facts to do this, okay? So if you're a climatologist and somebody's got a mistaken belief about climate change, then you're a much more uh, credible source for, for changing their mind. Again, it didn't always work, but it worked often enough that there was a statistically significant uh, finding. But here's the surprise, because there was a second method uh, that also worked, uh, and this was called technique rebuttal. And this was based on the idea that all science denial is the same. Whether you're a flat earther or a climate denier or a COVID denier, any of them, they all reason in the same way. Obviously, there are different 
uh, content in their beliefs, but the strategy that they go through uh, is precisely the same. Uh, these five tropes are uh, were first codified by the Hufnagel brothers, some later work by the cognitive scientists, um, John Cook and Stephen Lewandowski. And um, there's uh, quite a bit of excellent work available now to sort of show you how you can use this to push back. And Betch and Schmidt even give some scripts for how to do this. The five tropes are these. Science deniers always cherry pick evidence, believe in conspiracy theories, rely on fake experts and denigrate real experts, engage in illogical reasoning, and insist that science has to be perfect. That last one is really my favorite because if you think about it, uh, in some ways they're, they don't understand science, but they think that they're scientists. And what the, the biggest mistake that they make here, I think, is that they tend to think that science is about proof, as if it were Euclidean geometry. Science is actually about warrant, warranted belief. When there's sufficient evidence, then you change, their, change your mind. For a science denier, that's not the case. They want proof. Uh, that is, they want proof of the things they don't want to believe. They're actually quite gullible in the things that they do want to believe. So what Betch and Schmidt showed is that if you can learn these five tropes as a layperson, you can use these, uh, you know, identifying when somebody's engaging in a conspiracy theory, or when they're engaging in illogical reasoning. You can use that uh, to push back against a science denier. Um, now some bad news. The study showed that we can only mitigate, not overturn the effect of uh, bad information. So when you're sharing this bad information and then you're thinking, well, you know, I'm gonna debunk that now. You can debunk it for a lot of people, but you'll never get all of them. What that means is that it's better not to share the, uh, the bad information in the first place. And Betch and Schmidt actually have a little joke in their, uh, in their paper where they say, you know, if you're invited to a debate with a science denier, say yes, but then at the last minute cancel. If it means that the debate will be canceled because then people won't hear the bad information. If the debate's gonna go on anyway, then you, you have to show up. Um, the worst thing is for uh, bad information to get out there, incorrect information. But the second worst thing is to, uh, to just to not show up and just to have it, to have it out there and be uh, uncorrected. Okay, so as an academic study, uh, as I said, this was a brilliant study, but there were a couple of limitations in it. Not that there were uh, flaws, what they showed was what they set out to show, it was, uh, it was well done. But there are some limitations in how you apply this study to the real world. Um, you and I, for instance, wanna know how to talk to science deniers in real life. Um, this experiment was done online, okay? It was done uh, in a lab. Um, first, I wanna talk about the, the limitation of time proximity. The study only dealt with debunking science denial messages immediately after they were heard, okay? So they would present the false information and then they would immediately debunk it. But what do you do about overturning the beliefs? of somebody who is not hearing the bad information for the first time. In fact, what do you do about somebody who's been marinating in misinformation for years in some cases? Can you overturn their beliefs? You know, would these techniques work for hardcore science deniers, not just for people who are hearing it for the first time? Second, as I pointed out, the study was only done online, but in real life, you tend to meet science deniers in person. Um, across the Thanksgiving table, you know, at, at a party, and, or at least in some sort of interactive forum, and you want to know what can you say uh, to these folks, which raises the following question in my mind. The Betz and Schmid uh, study was very well done, but could it be extended? That is, could you use their uh, content rebuttal and technique rebuttal to help with uh, encountering a science denier face-to-face -face, and a, even a hardcore science denier face-to-face, -face, would these techniques work? Now, I think there are some answers to these questions, but they unfortunately outrun the scientific literature. To my knowledge, there's been no empirical literature which has measured this. If it exists, please let me know because I've been looking for it for quite some time. 
Um, and in writing my book, How to Talk to a Science Denier, I started to think about, well, you know, could, but what happens? Because surely there are people who do change their mind. And I started to collect a very thick file of anecdotal accounts of uh, hardcore science deniers who changed their mind. And of course, this is not peer reviewed. It's not a scientific study. But the interesting thing that I found was that all of the people who changed their mind did it in exactly the same way. It was always the same story. It was always the same thing had happened to them. And to me, that raised this question, and I hope some scientist studies it uh, someday. I've actually been in touch with Cornelia Betch to, you know, to ask, and, and uh, if we ever can get in the same room after COVID, we might uh, talk about this a little, a little further. Um, virtually every science denier who has changed their mind has done so after a face-to-face -face encounter with someone with whom they have a trusting relationship. It is always a function of one-to-one -one persuasion. Now, there are many examples uh, in the news media, and you can go out there and, and uh, look for them if you'd like. Um, you can see how far away we are here from the information deficit model, okay? Um, Betch and Schmidt showed that sometimes information helps with content rebuttal. But when you've got the hardcore face-to-face -face, uh, uh, deniers, what do you do? Um, this is what, uh, what actually works. Um, I'm going to now tell you a couple of uh, stories. Um, there's a, uh, you can look this up yourself, uh, though not right now. Uh, in the Washington Post, uh, there's a story that's called, um, It Will Take Off Like Wildfire. And it's about uh, an outbreak of measles in Vancouver, Washington, which is just across the Columbia River from Portland, Oregon, where I grew up. And there was quite an active anti-vax community there. And so, of course, uh, that's where the measles outbreak was going to occur. And Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State sent down a bunch of scientists and public health officials um, to meet with the anti-vaxxers to try to convince them to, to vaccinate their kids with the, the MMR vaccine. And um, it worked, um, not to say that they got everyone, but they got enough people that this was really a way to show that you know one-on-one -on -one encounters do actually work. Um, if you read the story in the Washington Post, you'll see that you know, these scientists were very committed to this. They would talk to people. Um, one woman reported that there was a scientist who explained cell interaction for two hours at a whiteboard. And she said, you know, he was so warm and, and uh, you know, I trusted him. And afterward, I decided to vaccinate my child. Um, there's another story. Uh, this one's actually my, my favorite of the two. Um, there was a, a U.S. congressman a few years back named uh, Jim Bridenstine uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives. And he was such a climate denier that he once gave a speech on the floor of Congress about, uh, you know, in which he said all the things that climate deniers say. You know, that the, the global temperature hadn't actually uh, gone up in the last 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, just all, all of the denier nonsense. He was sharing this on the floor of the, of the U.S. House. So, of course, Donald Trump appointed him to be the head of NASA, because what else would you do with, you know, somebody who is a climate denier, but put him in charge of all the scientists who are, you know, uh, studying climate change? Well, a very interesting thing happened once Bridenstine became the head of NASA. Within a couple of months, he changed his mind. And he not only changed his mind, he gave another speech in which he said, I was wrong. Climate change is real and it's caused by human beings. Now, this is a pretty amazing thing for anybody to admit they were wrong, let alone somebody in the US Congress. And so it raises this question, how did this happen? What, what influenced it? Well, he said you know, he read a lot. Well, presumably he read a lot before. I have a theory of what happened. Once he was the head of NASA, the scientists that he was denigrating in his speeches were not some faceless people that he'd never met. They were people that he saw in the hallway that he had lunch with, uh, people who actually seemed pretty nice and trustworthy. And when the message about climate change came to him face to face from somebody that he trusted, he changed his mind. This is all to show that even empirical beliefs can be tribal. It's about more than just facts and evidence. It's about the community from which you get your information. 
our beliefs are shaped by trust and identity and values. Again, it's which community are you in? Who do you trust? This presents a bit of a problem though in talking to a science denier because if somebody's beliefs aren't based on evidence, how can you get them out of it with new evidence? Jonathan Swift said it best, you can't reason somebody out of something that they didn't reason themselves into in the first place. But Betch and Schmidt showed that you can, uh, in some circumstances, convince people. So how do you do it? This is where the practical experience comes in uh, and where you know, some other folks that I've read have recommended this and it, and it works. If you're dealing with a hardcore denier, context matters a lot. Face-to-face -face is best. That's where trust is built. Um, it's not that evidence can't be persuasive. It's that you have to approach somebody with evidence in the right way. Don't yell at them. Don't insult them. Stay calm. If you can be patient and respectful, and if you can actually listen to what a science denier has to say, inevitably, they will say, don't you think I'm right? or they'll ask what you think. And then is your opportunity to raise a few questions. Um, Nine and Riefler, the folks who did the backfire effect study have uh, joined on this bandwagon. They're now studying uh, what could actually change people's mind. Here's some more practical details. I guess these are based on empirical research. Uh, graphs help. Uh, words sometimes don't persuade, but a graph uh, will be more persuasive. And um, they also found that emphasizing scientific, <coughs> pardon me, emphasizing scientific consensus was particularly effective with conservatives. So if you're talking to somebody who's a political conservative, lean more heavily on the idea that there's a scientific consensus that might have a better uh, shot at working. But the, the overall point is to listen. Listening has two beneficial effects. One is that the person feels heard, okay? But the second is that they will often give you everything that you need to refute them on their own terms, right? They're, they're telling you what, why they believe what they believe. And so you can use that uh, in, in speaking with them, always in a respectful way. So what I think is that you can't always change somebody's mind for them, but you can create the conditions in which they can begin to change their own mind. Um, don't expect it to be a one-off. Don't expect somebody to just change their mind on the spot. Plant the seed of doubt and then keep coming back to them uh, so that they enjoy the, the conversation and they begin to trust you. Here, I wanna share one of my uh, personal experiences. In November, 2018, uh, I went to the Flat Earth International Conference in Denver, Colorado. Now, I'm a philosopher of science. Um, I've studied science deniers for 20 years, but I wanted to go. I wanted to see them in the flesh, and I wanted to see the worst science deniers that I could imagine. So I, uh, I bought the ticket, and I went out there, and the first day, I kept my mouth completely shut. It was a two-day conference, and I had on my, you know, uh, my disguise, my flannel shirt. I wasn't wearing my button down. And I had on the, the lanyard with the you know, Flat Earth International Conference. And it was a joyous atmosphere. They loved uh, speaking to one another. And for the whole first day, they thought that I was one of them. I, I didn't pretend. I didn't say anything that I didn't believe in. I just listened. They had a lot to say. But the second day, I came out as a philosopher of science. Now, I caught a break here because to a person, everybody that I met um, and maybe this is true of all flat earthers, surely not all, said that they were a flat earther based on the evidence, okay? And which immediately makes you skeptical, <laughs> how could that be? But they had seminars on what they considered to be the evidence uh, for flat earth and against the, uh, the global earth. Uh, they insisted that their views were not based on faith because I, I mean, I could have used that, right? A number of them were evangelical Christians. And if I'd said, oh, well, you're not a scientist, your view is just based on faith. They said, no, 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 my view is based on evidence. Now, that gave me an opening. I knew that I should not use that opening just to try to cram evidence down their throat. Because to tell you the truth, 
uh, well, for one thing, I'm not a scientist, so I couldn't really do content rebuttal. Um, but the other is that they already knew the evidence. The evidence for the uh, global Earth has been around for 2,300 years. Um, it's not like I'm going to be telling them about Newton and Aristarchus for the first time in their lives. They had actually studied this and just thought that the scientists were lying to them. Remember, conspiracy theorists. So they, they didn't believe it. They didn't trust scientists. They thought all the evidence for global Earth was flawed. So why were they going to believe it from me? That would have been a wasted opportunity. So instead, as a philosopher, I thought, OK, I'm not going to ram evidence down their throat but I'm gonna challenge them about how they're reasoning on the basis of what they think uh, the evidence is. Here was the question that I had the most luck with. They would say their views were based on evidence. And I would say, okay then, tell me this, what evidence, if I had it right now available, would convince you that you were wrong? And then I shut up. And I let them think about that for a minute. And they seemed very flummoxed by that question. I really couldn't get anybody to answer that. A couple of people said proof. you know. And, and then we had a conversation about why scientists can't prove things. And neither could they. But that didn't mean we were, you know, that it was all equal, that that was a misconception about how science worked. Um, and the interesting thing about that question is that it was a question that I think they'd never heard before. And so it knocked them out of the script that they had, all the things that they'd heard from the seminars. And they had to really think about, you know, what evidence could actually possibly convince them. Because remember, if there is no evidence that could possibly convince you that you're wrong, then you're not a scientist. This goes a little bit to, to with a nod to Karl Popper, right? You have to be able to say, if your beliefs are based on evidence, what evidence would be inconsistent uh, with your beliefs. Um, so my working theory going into the Flat Earth Convention was that it wasn't based on evidence at all. It was based on identity and ideology. And in fact, that um, they were the, using the same kind of uh, identity and ideology that the other um, science seminars were using. And so I thought, look, if I could learn how to talk to a flat earther, then I could learn how to talk to a, clim a climate denier, et cetera. Okay. Um, I was also concerned that they use Flat Earth conferences to recruit new members. And I never forgot the fact that when I was speaking to somebody, we almost always had an audience. And even if I wasn't going to convince the person that I was speaking to, uh, the there was an audience of, uh, of other people listening. Um, and I also, the other reason I went to Flat Earth is I wanted to take a shot at the hardest of the hardcore. Okay, I didn't just want to try to work on somebody who was just hearing this information for the first time. I wanted to go after the, the hardest core believers that I could find face to face and see if I could do it. Um, my best conversation the whole time was with a guy who had just given a seminar on how to recruit people into flat earth. He ran street clinics and how to do it, how to you know, hold up the sign, engage people in conversation. And I thought, this is the guy I got to talk to. So the minute he came off stage, I invited him to dinner. And we went and had a two-hour dinner, my treat, just the two of us, in which the deal was we were going to talk about flat earth. And he said, okay, but you're trying to convince me. I'm going to try to convince you. So, you know, all right, game on. He was a very intelligent young man. He was a good debater, as you might imagine. Um, and he and I'll say this, he understood the stakes of my question, because I led with my hardest question, what evidence could convince you that you were wrong? The first thing he said was, you know, well, it would have to be something that I could see for myself, uh, like going up in a rocket. And, you know, I was thinking, well, okay, you know, this was before Elon Musk and, you know, all the rest of them, uh, Bezos, but that's not you know, something that's unforeseeable in the future, then he took it back and said, no, no, the window might be curved, you know, so there was conspirators, they might have put in a curved window. So it's going to make the earth look curved when it's really not. So I said, okay, how about this? Um, why don't we get in a plane together and fly over Antarctica? And he said, there are no flights over Antarctica, because this was one of their piece of evidence. I said, oh, no, and I pulled out of my back pocket a piece of paper that had a flight that went from um, South America to New Zealand and you know, would presumably go over Antarctica. And um, 
He said, have you been on that flight? And I said, no, neither of you, let's go. I'll pay for your ticket. I'm thinking, you know, I could crowdfund for this. You'd contribute $5 to that, wouldn't you? Um, but now we need a criteria, right? Because I can't have him just looking out the window and saying, oh, the window was curved or, you know, whatever it would be. So I propose this, according to me, um, I think Antarctica is about a thousand or 1500 miles across. There was this nonstop flight from South America to New Zealand. So we wouldn't have to stop for fuel. But if he was right, then Antarctica was in fact, what the Flat Earth International Conference folks tended to believe is that Antarctica was not a continent. It was a mountain range around the perimeter of the earth, which kept the water from falling off, which means that it's 24,000 miles. It was, surely we'd have to stop to refuel. And he shook my hand on it. And I was thinking, oh boy, oh boy, you know, now we're gonna do this. Um, two minutes later, he took it back. And I asked him why, and he said it was because um, he felt that maybe no plane ever had to stop to refuel. And I asked him to say more, and he said, well, you know, what if the whole thing has been a hoax? And I said, and I pushed him and I said, so you mean that the entire history of air travel, all of these planes stopping to refuel in Greenland are a hoax against the day when you and I might be sitting here having this private conversation. I'm trying to convince you, you know, doing the devil's work that the earth is actually round. And he said, yes. Now he was, a good enough debater that he understood the stakes of what he had just said, but he couldn't give it up. And I didn't convince him, you know, he didn't tear off his lanyard and come out to the parking lot and say what a fool I was. But I made a crucial mistake, which is that I didn't keep up with him because I had planted that seed of doubt pretty deeply and, you know, could have then said, oh, you know, I guess your view is based on faith then. I didn't want to go there. But I, I should have kept up with him to find out later um, and, and, and kept pushing that. Because even though I didn't convince him, I think that I did build some credibility by being there, by showing up in person. I think that I did build some trust. And I hope that uh, that, that might have worked over time, even though I didn't, uh, I didn't convince him or, or really anybody else at the, at the conference. Um, there, maybe that's not surprising. I mean, there's a social aspect to belief. There were 650 flat earthers and one of me, a little bit of media. Uh, it's very hard to convince somebody uh, in, a, uh, in a situation like that. But I hope that I made some difference. Um, and I think, and I'm gonna go back and I want scientists to go back with me. I've already got a commitment from one scientist, a physicist to go with me because I think that scientists need to take this more seriously. And you may laugh at that, but here's my, my idea. Science denial is getting worse. And even the flat earthers are contributing to a culture of denial in which, I mean, look how bad science denial has, has gotten. In fact, that was my thought when I saw that they had a conference with that. Really, has it come to this now, flat earth, really? Um, and think about, go back to the Betch and Schmidt study. They've empirically proven, well, they've empirically given very strong evidence to show that it is worth your while to talk to science deniers that sometimes you can change their mind. So when a scientist says, well, it's not worth talking to these people, are they being a science denier? I mean, it clearly is worth talking to these people. May, only they can say whether it's worth their time. But the point is, if we had an army of people who took science deniers seriously and went out there and spoke with them, I think that we might be able to make some headway. And here's the thing, if we don't, nothing is ever going to change. Now, I'd just like to close by saying a word about the stakes uh, if we don't do anything about science denial. And I wanna ask you to think about what the future might look like if we don't get a handle on this problem. It used to be that science deniers existed. They've always it existed probably as long as science. Um, but the guy in the tinfoil hat standing on the corner saying that we never went to the moon, he doesn't have to hand out a mimeograph sheet anymore. He's got the internet. He's not a lone crank anymore. He can find other people and persuade other people uh, to, uh, to believe in him. The difference these days is that science denial is organized and science denial 
uh, is for the most part organized by propagandists who can exploit the internet. Um, science denial is not a mistake, it's a lie. It is in someone's interest to create the kind of disinformation that science deniers believe. And they've got a friend in the internet because they can pump it out um, for their own economic or political or ideological interest. Mark the difference between misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is an accident, but disinformation is a lie. Um, and if you think about it, what that means is that a lot of the science deniers out there are victims. They're doing someone else's bidding. They are, um, they're being taken in. And somebody wants them to believe it. I've often said, stop asking why people believe such crazy things and start asking, why does someone want them to believe this? Okay. Um, and if there's anything that could ever give you empathy for a science denier, maybe it's that, okay? They're, they're victims of disinformation. And so when you're trying to summon the fortitude to listen to them, to be empathetic, to be calm and respectful, remember that they have been made into what they are. It's very few people who wake up one day and say, I bet we didn't go to the moon. They read it somewhere. They saw it on YouTube, okay? They, you go, if you put in flat earth on YouTube and you watch one flat earth video, you'll get 20 more. Virtually every flat earther that I spoke to, that's how they were recruited from videos on, uh, on YouTube, okay? What that means is that science denial is really three problems, not one. It's the creation of disinformation, the amplification of disinformation, and then the belief in disinformation. In my book, How to Talk to a Science Denier, I deal with the third problem, but it is worth thinking about the other two because the, prob the problem with the creation of disinformation and the amplification is maybe not as formidable as it seems. Hear me out. A few months ago, there was a story in NPR which reported that 65% of the anti-vax propaganda on Twitter was created by 12 people. There is a way to get ahead of this. Um, in the meantime, a lot of damage has already been done. Maybe part of undoing the damage, by the way, is to explain to science deniers that people are out there creating this. Now, to somebody who believes in conspiracy theories, here's a real live conspiracy. Some of the uh, scientific, the uh, uh, anti-science propaganda that we're finding on Twitter, that we're finding on YouTube, is uh, created by uh, a Russian intelligence service, who for you, there's an article in the New York Times about this not too many years ago, talking about the, uh, the war, Putin's long war on American science, uh, on GMOs, on vaccines, on COVID, on climate change. Um, the, the Russians are interested in fomenting discord in American society, and, and some of that is around uh, empirical information. In the meantime, I think that we have to uh, go out and speak with our fellow citizens. We have to, while we're working on the problem of the creation of disinformation and its amplification, we need to deal with some of these people who have already gone down the rabbit hole uh, of COVID denial, of, of vaccine denial. What can we say to them? What can we do? I've talked a little bit about what, what we can do. It's sometimes hard to find common ground with a science denier because they're the other, right? It's, it's us versus them and they feel that way about us as well. But their brains are no different than ours. They have the same cognitive biases that we do. And their politics are not necessarily different. Some areas of science denial have been politicized, but some have not. They can be smart, educated people. They can be our family and friends. And in fact, I'll bet that you know some science deniers in your own life. You just you know, think of who they are right now. People often say, you know, it's not polite over dinner, you know, over Thanksgiving dinner, don't talk about religion or politics. But I think that that's actually the perfect place to try to talk to somebody that you love and to try to get them to take their COVID vaccine or to believe the truth about climate change. Because you've already got a head start. They already trust you. They already love you. Um, and, and there are things that you can say. I, I heard a story the other day, a heartwarming story about a young woman who was trying to convince her father to believe in climate change. And he kept quoting, you know, these other fake experts to her. And she finally said, dad, 
why do you trust all these people that you've never met, but you don't trust your own daughter? And that helped, right? She made an emotional connection. If you can make an emotional connection with a science denier, that'll, that will help. Go out, go out and try it on the people in your life. Um, it might work, it might not, but it's gotta be easier than get, going into a ballroom with 650 flat earthers. That's it.